So in the past week, we've seen how a class can be created to compact things into one entity. For instance, in our game, we have a squiggly line that is represented by the line class. And the line class has certain data, like the position of the line points and the color of these, and the lines and columns of the screen. That's the data that belongs to line, and also some methods. Those are these functions over here at the top. Now, some of this is public, can be accessed uh, by other people using this line, and some of this is private, and this is completely hidden towards the user. And what this means is basically that on the right side, you can see that in the uh, program that we programmed using line, we can create a new line by just instantiating a line like this. Uh, it didn't need to be called line, could also be something uh, completely different, um, but we used line in this case uh, because it was a line. Um, and from this point on, we have an object that is a line of type line, and this line can have certain things that we can have as values, um, so the position of the line, for instance, and the colors, but also some functions that automatically come with line. And with the dot operator, we basically have line dot, something with which we can address this member function of line. For instance, the cycle function that uh, makes the line move uh, one little bit to the left. So what we've seen is one of the parts of this class is this constructor over here. The constructor in our case is something that uh, also takes two arguments, the lines and columns, the size of the screen basically that we have to our availability. But most of the constructors that uh, or the simplest constructor is a default constructor which has nothing. Um, we can actually add this one here. So this is over here straight away the default constructor. And in this case, our default constructor needs to do something with those uh, lines and columns of the screen, because that is, in the end, one of the parts of the data that uh, is held in this. So as soon as a line is instantiated, as soon as you create a line, we need to know what size the screen is. So we can, in this case, assume, oops, um, for instance, a 20 by 20 screen. And if we want to implement this, then we'll have to look at line.cpp, where all the functions are implemented, and where we have to um, create another constructor, just like that one, which, which is the default constructor, which has no argu arguments whatsoever. And what we'll do there is do exactly what is here in the constructor that uses something, um, in fact, we could um, use the default cons uh, we could call this particular constructor as well. In this case, we can simplify things a little bit by just saying that the lines in that case uh, is made equal to 20 and the columns uh, is 20 as well. In that case, all the rest is the same still. So we can save that. And from now on, we have two types of constructors. One where you uh, uh, explicitly say what the screen size is, and one where we assume that the screen size is 20 by 20. And that will kind of hope, uh, or there I hope that uh, that will tend to work uh, for most applications. Good. So when you have a constructor, this constructor is a function that automatically gets called when you want to initialize a class. So when a class is created, it automatically is also initialized in the data that is held in this class. And that is very similar to how, for instance, earlier we saw that if you have an integer um, that you call, give it a name, you call it i in this case, in that case, you reserve the piece of memory, but you didn't initialize this value yet. So only later when you, for instance, assign i the value 42, this value is actually there. It is never initialized to zero or something else. You know, you don't know what this value could be as soon as you instantiate this variable i. The same is true with classes. So as soon as you have a class, in this case called Frisky, for instance, um, as soon as you instantiate Frisky, then you basically reserve a piece of memory and also um, reserve uh, the fact that there is there are some methods that belong to Frisky, to this uh, inst uh, instance that is in this case of type cat. 
So a constructor initializes all the data that is required. So in this case, this constructor tends to take the age. Um, in this case, uh, Frisky is five years old. So we basically say we create a new instance of type cat called Frisky, and Frisky is five years old. So this is the main purpose of constructors. You can have multiple constructors as we just saw. So you can have default constructors and you can have multiple other constructors that have to be different in one way and one way only, which is the um, number of parameters and the type of the parameters. So you can have two constructors with just one parameter. So in this case, for instance, we have two um, constructors over here, one where we take an unsigned integer for the age and another one where we take the unsigned long integer for the weight. And those that would be in principle okay. However, this is asking for trouble because you can actually put a number here or put a number here. Both of them are integers. It will be really hard to figure out for any user if they want to create a cat instance, um, what this, um, this constructor does if they just supply one number, whether this is for the age or for the weight. And that can lead to lots of problems later on. So better there to use just a number of parameters or a very clear um, distinctive difference in what type of um, parameters you can give. So for instance, whenever you have one parameter, you just supply the age of the cat. When you have two parameters, you supply the age and then also the weight of the cat. Now the default constructor, if you don't supply it, uh, like we just, uh, we just supplied it in our example, but we don't do this, it automatically gets constructed nonetheless. So you could actually, in that case, call uh, the instantiation of Frisky, in this case, as a type cat, without anything, <clears throat> without anything as a parameter. So in this case, we don't supply the parameters. Just like you have integer i, we would have, in this case, a cat called Frisky. And um, in the background, if you, the, the person or the developer here did not supply a constructor for the default constructor of cat, it would basically have added an empty uh, member function. So a member function that has exactly the same name as the class, with no arguments and with no statements that define the function. Just as you have constructors, we also have destructors. And these structures are exactly the same as a constructor, except that the destructor um, is named differently. Instead of having the class name, it has a tilde plus the class name. Um, the question, however, we can ask ourselves at this point is why would we need a destructor? Because a constructor is necessary for initializing the values that belong to the class. Um, however, if you uh, destroy a class and when is a, the class destroyed? For instance, when you have a function like in this case and a, a, a particular instance of a class is created in this function, we know that after you exit this function, this is somehow freed. So basically this class is destroyed um, and automatically without um, at the end having to have uh, or to call a destructor. So this is definitely um, something that can happen, and the destructor is in that case called, and if you don't supply a constructor, just like with the constructor, an empty destructor is added to the class. And as I said already, the destructor is exactly the same in terms of definition, you just add the tilde in front of the name. It also has no return value, not even void. Now the reason why destructors are useful is something that we will see later. Um, in this chapter, at the end, we will still see uh, files. For instance, if you open a file, you need to close it, otherwise it's reserved inside the file system and you might have problems with uh, accessing the file later on in the same program, for instance. So when you exit a function and you have opened uh, within your class a particular file, then you need to close this file. And similar to the file as some type of external memory, you need to also free the memory of the class itself. And sometimes a uh, class contains not um, fixed memory, like an integer, which is four bytes, or a boolean, which is just um, one byte, but it can actually create a dynamic array that can be increased in size or decreased in size. And to make sure that we can clean that up, that we clean the entire array up, no matter how large it is, we can divide or we can dedicate the structure to freeing up that particular memory. That's something we will see much later. 
In terms of programming styles, we have to adhere to these simple things. If you implement a constructor, you tend to also need a destructor. So you should implement also a destructor in that case. And even if the destructor is empty, it is good practice to still implement one and then comment why you need a destructor that is empty. In that case, later on, it's much less confusing. And this goes also for the constructor, by the way. Now, the second thing I wanted to uh, see in this uh, particular video is uh, const member functions. Now, const is, uh, stands for constant, and with that we can make sure that the compiler knows that for the particular member functions that we supply to our class, that in this class, or in this member function, the data that belongs to our class, so in this case, for instance, the age and the weight of the cat, which are named its age and its weight, those things will not change within a particular function. So in this case, in the speak function, the idea is here that you just print out meow, for instance, then the age and the weight of the cat are not affected at all. The same for get age, which is basically an accessor, so basically with that, we just want to retrieve the age of the cat. Also here, we don't intend to change the age of the cat or the weights. And the same for the get weight function. Now, all of that is something that can create problems later. Perhaps another programmer joins uh, and starts re-implementing uh, this particular class. And when they um, create an in the CPP file, some extra commands or extra statements um, for this particular function that do change uh, the age and the weight of the cat, this would be an unintended thing. Um, and this would sometimes lead to problems that, uh, that only turn up much, much, much later. To make sure that that doesn't happen, the initial programmer could in that case add the const keyword just after the definition of the function. Um, and if you do this, uh, then you basically have the ability to show the compiler that whatever follows or however this function is implemented, it's, so it's implemented so that it will never change the data of the class. And this is, as I said, um, a kind of a safeguard whenever you create your class blueprints in the header file usually, you want to define already for a function whether this changes any of the data or whether it doesn't change any of the data. And if it doesn't, then you should add const straight away. Now, the, also the design guideline that we'll have is that you use constant functions wherever you, uh, you can. Because this basically forces yourself, but also other programs that you might work with or that might use your code later on to uh, not do certain things that this class and its member function were not supposed to uh, be used for. And uh, in general there, the compiler report and, uh, um, reports an error message, and this error message is, is usually much clearer than if you would have uh, unintended consequences later on by, for instance, changing things in a function where these things should not be changed. Now, as we've seen already in a header file, we define this contract with the class statements. Um, in our example, we just basically did this with just a few lines saying this is a class called line, it has certain public uh, member functions, and it has some private data uh, members. And this basically defines what this line is about. And with a little bit of uh, um, uh, commenting, we hopefully have something that can be used for everyone to make understandable what this line function, uh, this line class really does. And this is exactly what uh, this class interface is that is. So this interface defines a contract with whoever wants to use this particular class. For instance, uh, later on um, in, the, in the program that we have, so in Skullgrain, we can basically, um, in this case, use line in such a way. Now this is something that we want to make crystal clear, and that's why we tend to um, have a, a header file, a .h file, um, and a CPP file where we implement everything. So on that level, the visibility of everything that is implemented is kind of hidden away. People just need to look at the header file and not at the CPP file to understand what this class provides, what the interface for this class is. 
Um, the visibility of the private members in the class declaration might be seen as a design problem of C++ because everything that is private in this class is still visible as well, although people using this class are never able to access these particular things. That's also why we tend to put a private um, uh, data members in this case completely at the end. The first thing that people should see when they read what a class line is all about is the public part, because that's the only thing that concerns people. Um, so this is why some people think that this is uh, a little bit of a design flaw, because these are still uh, part of this, uh, of this contract of this class interface. However, they are needed by the compiler because the compiler from the header file can see then how much space needs to be reserved into memory um, to create an instance of this particular class. Right here we will see also that a uh, class interface, apart from the fact that you can uh, um, add uh, constants like we do here, for instance, um, also tends to be used, uh, tends to be adds, adding a header guard. Now this header guard is uh, a typical thing that always looks the same um, and where we will use exactly this. So we basically will say if not defined a particular word, we usually we take the file name underscore h for the header guards, and then if that is not defined, we define it. Then we have our class uh, definition and everything else that, ne that is necessary for this header. And in the end, we have this end if that belongs to this. Now, this is something that is uh, uh, guarding the fact that sometimes you might um, have one header um, file that is included in multiple times in a project. So in multiple files, Multiple files of these could call or could be using um, the class cat. And if this is happening multiple times, this might lead to problems. To make sure that that doesn't happen, we have this header guard so that uh, the compiler goes through these lines. In the beginning, the first time, this particular um, um, definition is not defined yet. So this particular macro is not defined yet. And if it's not defined, it defines this. If, however, it is defined already, it basically goes straight away to the end if, and everything in between that is skipped. So the first time, it will go through all the lines. The second time um, cat.h is read, it will basically uh, skip after this if not defined cat.h because cat underscore h is already defined and it will skip this. So this is a way to make sure that your compiler reads the same class interface only once. And that's also something that we will from now on start using. So to update our program a little bit more, as I said in the header file, um, and this is usually done completely at the top, or we can actually start uh, where the comment starts, uh, we say if not define um, and this is small um, line underscore h, then we define it, and at the end we have our end if. There we go. And we basically, or we tend to say also here that this belongs to um, define the header guard. So in this case, line underscore h. So this allows us to later, if we have a more complex program, to only access the contents of this header file only once for the parser. And it's called the header guard. Right. The next thing that, uh, or the, the final thing that I wanted to, sh uh, to add to this is to uh, say that, uh, for instance, the functions like get y position is something that will never change the function itself. So also here it's important um, to keep all of that. And also cycle, it's exactly the same. Also there we add a const keyword to make sure that whenever we have cycle, oh, cycle actually doesn't, sorry, because cycle does update the position and the colors. It shifts the entire array. Um, the constructor, of course, also changes um, these private data members of the class line, right? 
So that brings us to the end of section 6.3. We can see now that uh, we can just include this interface um, to define all the um, all the functions that we have uh, reserved for uh, for our class cats. And then we can see that in the main program or in an executable, we can just now instantiate a cat called Frisky. We can set its age, it can speak, and then we can basically get some extra um, functionality out of this. So this kind of shows you how we can define classes, define the interface for classes, and use those just as we previously defined uh, a variable.